All right, in this study we will be talking about the water and the blood of the King Jesus version. Another very interesting study coming up here. Turn in your King James Bible to 1 John, the book of 1 John, chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5, we'll begin in verse 1 and read down to verse 9. We'll see some very interesting things here. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and every one that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and keep his commandments. Tied in with the word of God, in other words, the written scriptures that we're reading. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. Please get a hold of the key words here, water, blood, and truth. And look at the next one, verse 7, that you have to have a King James Bible to have here. Uh, written out correctly, even you know a lot of the new versions might include it, but then they'll cast doubt on it. They'll say, well, the Johannine comma, uh, there's not much early manuscript evidence for it and whatever else, and yes, there is, but that's beside the point. That's another study. Verse 7, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the Spirit, and the water, and the blood, and these three agree in one. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God, which he hath testified of his Son. Now we need to look at a couple points here in this passage. I'm going to set that down, hit my notes here. Point number one. Jesus came by water and blood. Hmm. Number two. The Spirit is truth and bears witness. Number three, the spirit, water, and blood bear witness in earth. What are those different things? We'll get back to that. Uh, number four, the witness of God testifies of his son. It's a testimony. It's written. All right? It isn't just some kind of a thing of each of us kind of gets a slightly altered version of it. No, there's a testimony there. And it testifies of Jesus Christ. That's why we have a King Jesus version. If you've seen the first study about the Word and light, how they com, you know, compare to each other, then we're going to go into this one here and we'll see how the water and the blood compares. Uh, I did a live stream years ago and somebody asked me, they said, what is the point of the water and the blood in 1 John chapter 5? And I said, well, I need to study that. Well, here you go. This is the study coming out about it. Next, we're going to go to the book of John. John chapter 19. Back to the four Gospels, the last of the four Gospels, John chapter 19. John 19, verse 32 and 35. Very interesting story here and very important. John chapter 19, verse 32. Then came the soldiers and brake the legs of the first and of the other, which was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they brake not his legs. And But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. And he that saw it bear record, and his record is true, and he knoweth that he, sa that he saith true, uh, that ye might believe. Hmm. So there's water and blood, and there's a record of that. God testifies of his Son. Hmm. Water and blood. Reference to the written scriptures. And again, the whole point of this whole series of King Jesus Version studies. If you are saying that you believe in Jesus and yet you can reject this book and hate this book, you're not saved. You don't understand. You are yet in darkness. You are yet in your sins. I will tell you that. But notice, uh, very important here in this passage, we'll get back to it here in a little bit, the blood and the water came out after Jesus died and that this record is true. So 
the blood and the water weren't there in terms of when Jesus was dying or whatever else. After he dies, the water and the blood appears. Huh. So what are you talking about? Hebrews chapter 9. Go to Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9, beginning in verse 8. Just... Hebrews chapter 9, verse 8. The Holy Ghost this signifying, that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing, which was a figure for the time then present, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience, which stood only in meats and drinks and divers washings and cardinal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. But Christ being come and high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once unto the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgression that were under the first testament, testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. Jesus is the testator, another one of his titles. For a testament is of force after men are dead. What came out after Jesus died? The water and the blood. The testament there. Hmm. A testament is of force after after men are dead. You'll see why I'm saying all this as we tie all of this stuff together. Otherwise it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth, whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats with water, huh, blood and water, and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people. Sprinkles a book with blood and water? Hmm. We'll get back to it. Saying this is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these... Purified with what? Blood and water. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ is not entered into the holy places which made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the, in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin at, by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed unto men, once to die, but after this the judgment. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Um, sorry to the Roman Catholics, you don't have to re-sacrifice Christ. The um, bloody sacrifice of the Mass and transubstantiation and the Eucharist and all the other Satanic nonsense. Um, Jesus sacrificed himself once. But um, Jesus is the testator, which would mean what? Who brought in the New Testament? Jesus did. Who made the Old Testament happen? Jesus. That's why you could call this book the King Jesus Version. The Old Testament is Jesus, about Jesus. The New Testament is about Jesus. This book is his book. It's about Jesus. You understand where I'm going with this whole thing? Both were dedicated with water and blood. Hmm. Uh, the Old Testament sprinkled with water and blood. The New Testament 
The water and blood came out of Jesus' side after he died. The New Testament comes in with the death of the testator. Pretty amazing. 1 John chapter 5. You can go back there to 1 John chapter 5. We'll see some more tie-ins here to everything. 1 John chapter 5, verses 10 through 13. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. There's a record. There's a testimony. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. Um, how can we claim to know Jesus Christ, as I've been saying all throughout this study, if we have no perfect written record? It's not even logical. It doesn't even make any sense. And yet so many people claim that very thing. Why? They're in darkness. They don't have the light of God's word. The blood wasn't really given. It's, it's not there to, um, it didn't pay for their sins because they're still in their sins. Say it that way. Now let's go to Numbers chapter 20. Back to the Old Testament. Show you some more interesting things with water and blood and how it's connected to Jesus Christ. Numbers chapter 20. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. For the newer students of Scripture out there, you can, the beauty of this stuff being on the internet and having it as a recording, you're not sitting in some classroom or whatever I'm, and I'm teaching you and you're frantically trying to go to the table of contents and flipping. Uh, you have time that you can go in your paper King James Bible and look up these things. And it's important to have a paper one because the online stuff can be tampered with and whatever else. You need a paper King James Bible. Um, Numbers chapter 20, verse 7, down through verse 13. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Take the rod, and gather thou the assembly together, thou and Aaron thy brother, and speak ye unto the rock. Before their eyes, and it shall give forth his water. His what? His water? I say water, but you know, water, whatever. Um... And thou shalt bring them, bring forth, uh, and thou shalt bring forth to them water out of the rock, so thou shalt give the congregation and their beasts drink. And Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation together before the rock, and he said unto them, Here now, ye rebels, must we fetch you water out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand, and with his rod he smote the rock twice. And the water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank, and their beasts also. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, Because ye believed me not, to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore ye shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given them. This is the water of Meribah, because the children of Israel strove with the Lord, and he was sanctified in them. Even though they strove with him, he, was still, he still gave them the water. Um, there are people that strive with the Lord, and yet he still gives them the water of his word. Hmm. And uh, you can either come to the Lord and ask the Lord for the interpretation. Lord, please, I don't understand this. What does this verse mean or whatever else? And the Lord, the rock, he will give you the interpretation. Or you can smite upon this book and you can go to the textual critics and everybody else and you can go to the Greek and the Hebrew and change it to fit your meaning. And um, you end up getting messed up as a result. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. See, where does the Bible say that Jesus Christ is the rock? 1 Corinthians chapter 10. First Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 5. Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. And were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And did all eat the same spiritual meat. And did all drink the same spiritual drink. 
for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with many of them God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. There's no question. The rock is another one of Jesus' names. Um, some, you know, wicked pervert out there calls himself the rock, uh, some Hollywood actor, professional wrestler guy or whatever else. Why would he take a blast or title and blaspheme God like that? Because that's the only way he can get any kind of attention. You have to, you know, really be an achiever serving the devil to get to his level of fame and success. Um, and what he's really doing is he's just uh, earning his damnation. And he deserves it. Uh, so what point am I trying to make by all, all of this? You say, well, there's definitely some tie-ins between water and blood. No question about it. Well, uh, what did the Old Testament saints have? The Old Testament saints had the water, but they had to wait for the pure blood of Jesus Christ. An interesting thing there. Now, what did Jesus do when he was here at first on the earth? And uh, what was the first miracle that Jesus performed? John chapter 2. Go to John chapter 2. John chapter 2, verse 1 through 11. And the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto him, They have no wine. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. Interesting statement. We'll get back to that. Um, his mother saith unto the servants, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. And there were set there six water pots of stone, after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins apiece. Jesus saith unto them, Fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said unto them, Draw out now, and bear unto the governor of the feast, and they bear it. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom, and saith unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, then that which is worse. But thou hast kept the good wine until now. This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee, and manifested forth his glory, and his disciples believed on him. Um, Jesus didn't turn that water into grape juice. Okay, There are some rather fervent uh, people out there that try to say that wine of any kind is evil and whatever else. No, the miracle was that he turned it water into wine that was aged, showing that he not only had power over creation, but also power over time. That's what God can do. So, turns water into wine that's, that's aged, that's fermented. Very important miracle there. Um, but uh, you say, what's the overall meaning there? Well, very simple. Jesus turned water, the Old Testament, into wine. Wine being a type of blood. We'll see that in upcoming studies and everything as we go through this whole thing. Jesus is turning the Old Testament into the New Testament there. And it's interesting. I mean, think about what Mary says to him there. Um, and they wanted wine. The mother of Jesus saith unto him, they have no wine. <laughs> Did the Jews of the Old Testament have the blood of Jesus Christ? No, they didn't. You say, now come on, you're stretching it. Look at what Jesus says. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. <laughs> no, just turn the water into wine, Jesus. What do you mean, mine hour is not yet come? You see? Jesus makes a much deeper meaning there. Hmm. A very deep thing indeed. Exodus chapter 7. Go back in the Old, in the Old Testament to Exodus chapter 7. Exodus chapter 7, verse 19 and 20. 
And the Lord spake unto Moses, Say unto Aaron, Take thy rod, and stretch out thine hand upon the waters of Egypt, water, upon their streams, and upon their rivers, and upon their ponds, and upon all their pools of water, and they became blood. And there, and that there may be blood throughout all the land of Egypt, both in vessels of wood and in vessels of stone. And Moses and Aaron did so, as the Lord commanded. And he lifted up the rod, and smote the waters that were in the river, in the sight of Pharaoh, and in the sight of his servants. And all the waters that were in the river were turned to blood. Huh. Water turned to blood. The first thing Jesus does when he shows up, he turns water into wine. Interesting. Revelation chapter 3. Or, excuse me, Revelation chapter 11, verse 3. Um, it doesn't end there in the Old Testament. It happens again in the future, if you know your Bible. Revelation chapter 11. Revelation chapter 11, verse 3. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. These have power to shut heaven and to that it rain not in the days of their prophecy. You ready? And have power over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all the plagues, with all plagues as often as they will. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them, and shall overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and in half, and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them, and make merry, and shall send gifts one to another, because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. And after three days and in half the spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven, saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. And the same hour was there a great earthquake, and the tenth part of the city fell, and in the earthquake quake were slain of men seven thousand and the remnant were affrighted and gave glory to the God of heaven huh and if you study it out it's Moses and Elijah are the two witnesses and they are going around turning water into blood why why would they do a thing like that well because it's the time of Jacob's trouble why did they do it the first time because the children of Israel were in bondage in Egypt and they had to be brought out of Egypt by signs and wonders to show that it was God that was telling them to leave. Um, the Jews today are still in bondage. They are there and they um, have rejected the New Testament. They've rejected this blessed book. And so therefore, God is going to have to do the same miracles again. Turn water into blood so that they will accept not only the water of the Old Testament, but the blood of the New Testament. Hmm. See about that here in a minute. Revelation chapter 16. Revelation, Revelation chapter 16, verse 1. And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. And the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth, and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast, and upon them which worshipped his image. And the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea, and it became as the blood of a dead man, and every living soul died in the sea. And the third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and fountains of waters, and they became blood. There's a reason God is doing this. Don't tell me it just he just kind of, oh, I think I'll just turn water into blood. There's a big thing going on here, very deep, profound uh, teaching. Verse 5, And I heard the angel of the waters say, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and wast and shalt be, because thou hast judged thus. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, 
for they are worthy. And I heard another out of the altar say, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are thy judgments. Hmm. God's judgments are written in a book, brethren. Very interesting. Um, but when you get right down to it, the, the whole point of the time of Jacob's trouble, like I said, it's the time of Jacob, Israel, time of their trouble. And basically, those lost people are going to have to learn to drink the blood. You say, why? Well, that's all that they'll have. They're worthy. You've given them blood to drink. Um, but there's a dual meaning there. You see, there's the physical meaning of water being turned to physical water being turned to physical blood, but there's the spiritual meaning where those Jews, they rejected the blood of the New Testament, but now they have to drink it in order to be saved. Hmm. Very interesting. Hebrews chapter 10. Go to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1 through 9. For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, which uh, can never, with those sacrifices which they offered year by year, continually make the comers thereunto perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered, because that the worshippers once purged should have had no more conscience of sins. But in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again made of sins every year, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. And burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will, O God. Above when he said, Sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin thou wouldest not, neither hadst pleasure therein. Um, which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. Hmm. God takes away the first, that he can establish, so that he can establish the second. And how did he establish the New Testament? Matthew chapter 26. When you get down to studying all of this stuff, you realize that everything in history that pertains to this book and the future that's coming yet, it's all carefully orchestrated by the God of heaven. And it's an amazing, amazing thing to see how uh, powerful, omnipotent our God is. Matthew chapter 26, beginning in verse 26. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it, and brake it, and gave it to the disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup, and gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth, henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom." Jesus just gave a prophecy there that most people miss. They completely miss it. But what did, and I'll get to that prophecy here in a minute. But what is the New Testament? How did the New Testament come in? It came in with the death of the testator. When he died on the cross and they put a spear into his side and what came out? Water and blood. They drank of that rock. Water came out of the rock. Jesus Christ is the rock. Jesus Christ shed his blood on the cross. Huh. The book is sprinkled with water and blood. But you can be saved and be a Christian and in right with God and yet reject this book. I get a little bit you know, arrogant and sarcastic and whatever else because I have... I want people to watch my videos and to come away knowing what I'm saying. I don't want to be vague and ambiguous. I hate vague and ambiguous preachers. Okay, They're servants of the devil. I want to be crystal clear in what I'm trying to say. And that's why I use very caustic language that a lot of people get offended by and whatever else. Because I want it to be plain and no confusion about what I'm saying. But let me just say this. If you're out there 
and you don't believe this book because you've been confused by seminary or some hireling in your church building that you go to, you need to rethink some things. Because I'm going to tell you right now, the three witnesses that are in the earth are all tied into this book. And if you reject those three witnesses, you cannot go to heaven. Plain and simple. The water, the blood, and the spirit. The Holy Spirit will guide you into all truth. Wash them with the water of the word. The blood of the what did we just read here in verse 28? The blood of the New Testament. Well, I'm a Jew. I accept the Old Testament. Then all you have is water. You need water and blood. And the blood of the New Testament is what will get you to heaven. The water of the Old Testament. It's good. It's necessary. It's there. It sets the foundation for what comes later. But don't think that you can be cleansed from your sin by simply drinking of the water of the Old Testament. You can't be. The blood has been shed. The testator brought in the New Testament. Luke chapter 22. There's power when you preach this book and when you live by this King James Bible. But when you start to turn against it, the power goes away. That's what happened to every country that used to hold this book in high regard and now they just discard it. Luke chapter 22, verse 41 through 44. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast and kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou wilt be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Huh. His sweat was like blood. It doesn't say his sweat was blood. It says like blood. Okay, please understand that there. Was as it were great drops of blood. As it were. But isn't it that interesting? Again, sweat would be a form of water. Uh, your body removing toxicity. That's what sweat is. Water and blood. Hmm. And Lord went through great agony so that we could have this book, this blessed book. But it doesn't matter. You don't have to believe it to be saved. Come on. Not accurate. Hebrews chapter 10. The book of Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 10 through 22. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest standeth daily, ministering and off offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. The Mass is a good one of that, and of course the Jews in the Old Testament. If they're still trying to do that, the animal sacrifices, those sins or that those sacrifices will not take away sin. Um, but this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God, from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he hath per perfected forever them that are sanctified, whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us. For after that he had said before, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord, I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. For where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us, through the veil, that is to say, his flesh, and having an high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Huh. So there we have in verse 19, the blood of Jesus down here in verse 22, washed with pure water. Hmm. So let me just make something clear. 
I am a Christian, member of the Church of the Living God. It doesn't mean I accept the New Testament and I reject the Old Testament. No, they're both there. The water and the blood. I can look back to the Old Testament and see a lot of lessons that apply to me today. But I have to come and look at this world and say my salvation and everything else is based on the New Testament, not the Old Testament. So I learn from the Old Testament, but I'm saved through the New Testament. Water and blood. Ephesians chapter 5. I've referred to this passage already, but we'll go here and read it. Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians 5. Verse 22. We'll begin there. Read down to the end of the chapter. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word hmm. that he might present it to himself a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing but that it should be holy and without blemish so ought men to love their wives as their own bodies he that loveth his wife loveth himself for no man ever yet hated his own flesh but nourisheth and cherisheth it even as the lord the church for we are members of his body of his flesh and of his bones for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Um, we're washed by the word of God, Old and New Testament, in other words. Um, you're washed. Both things are said to wash a Christian. Water and blood. That's how we're washed, brethren. You can't just say, well, Pauline epistles only. That's all that's for me, and I just reject everything else. Um, doctrinally, yeah, the Pauline epistles are there for a Christian today. But in terms of the blessings and things of the Old Testament, there's a lot of really nice blessings. And by the way, if a man is supposed to wash his wife with the Word of God, what better place to go to than Proverbs 31? And read it as a challenge to your wife, but read it as a challenge to yourself, too, their husband. The Proverbs 31 woman requires a Proverbs 31 man. You have to provide for her so she can do all that work. And you have to praise her. It's an important thing. Without the water of the Old Testament, um, that'd be rough. That's why our King James Bible, our King Jesus Version, has an Old Testament here and a New Testament here. It's important. You need both, because that's the three witnesses in the earth. Hebrews chapter 13. Well, I believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. I believe in the manifestation of the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit. And what position in your life do you have of this King James Bible? Well, it's a good translation. I don't really take it to church anymore. We have our, you know, we get into our healing services and whatever else, and you don't need to bring your Bible. You're false. You're false if that's what you do. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7. Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. Be not carried about with divers and strange doctrines, for it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats, which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. We have an altar, whereof they have no right to eat which serve the tabernacle. For the bodies of those beasts which, whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin, are burned without the camp. Wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. Let us go forth therefore unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. 
For here, here have we no continuing city, but we seek one to come. Um, those who are sanctified by the blood of Jesus seek a continuing city. Hmm. First Peter chapter one. Go to first Peter chapter one. First Peter chapter one, verses one through five. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. Seeking that city to come, New Jerusalem, it's reserved up there for us. Who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Um, your inheritance is reserved in heaven, and it will be revealed in the last time. But how would you know that if you don't have the word of God as your standard? If you're not led by this book, how could you possibly say that you know anything in, about the future? You see, Satan's churches come out and they want you to believe that uh, you can have this special relationship with God and the Bible is just sort of a, eh, it's there. The Catholic Church, we have sacred scripture and divine tradition. And divine tradition usurps the authority of sacred scripture. No, it doesn't never has and never will. And if you don't hold this book as the highest standard, it's not looking too good for you. First Peter chapter 1, verse 18 through 25, we'll read that. For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, and with the precious, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who by him do believe in God that raised him up from the dead, and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God. Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently." being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away, but the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. Well, I can be saved and I can just reject the book. Well, <laughs> amazes me. All the years of ministry that I've been in and I've met so many people that just have no respect at all for this book. And they'll just change it and twist it and I'll just use a Vatican version if I want to and whatever else. No, yeah, I, you know, the Bible's okay, but you know, I have a relationship with Jesus and I don't care what the Bible says. It's a problem. Revelation chapter 5 verses 1 through 10. And I saw on the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book, written within and on the backside, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither, upon, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much, because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book, and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent forth into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of saints. 
And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Hmm. So what do we have? Jesus is the only one who can reveal this book to someone. And if they don't believe in the book, it's because Jesus hasn't revealed it to them. They don't have the water, they don't have the blood, and they don't have the Spirit. It's just that simple. Revelation 19. Revelation chapter 19, verse 11 through 13. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. Written. Huh. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Hmm. You know, you might be able to say that this uh, book is clothed in blood. The blood of the New Testament. That's there, but also the blood of the martyrs of Jesus Christ. A lot of people died so that we could hold this book in our hands. A lot of people were killed by the Roman Catholic Church because they uh, wouldn't submit to uh, the Eucharist or other many other things that the Catholic Church added to the Scriptures, their divine traditions. Not divine, more like devil's traditions. Revelation 21, verses 1 through 6. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them. And they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them, and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. Hmm. The water of life. Revelation 22, verse 1 through 7. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. And they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads, and there shall be no night there. And they need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. And he saith, and he said unto me, These sayings are faithful and true, and the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. Are you keeping the sayings of the prophecy of this book? Do you accept the witness in earth of the water? Old Testament and the blood of the New Testament, and the Holy Spirit that guides you into all truth. Does this book bring light into your life? Do you accept the Word of God? Or do you reject the Word of God and yet pretend to be a Christian, pretend to be saved? It's a scary thing. And there's going to be a lot of people that uh, stand before God one day and they hear the fearful words Depart from me, ye cursed and everlasting fire, I never knew you. Prepared for the devil and his angels, I never knew you. Um, 
you better make sure that you have a right relationship with God and a right relationship with this book right here. If you don't hold this King James Bible, this King Jesus version, if you don't hold it in high regard, you're not saved. The Holy Spirit is not there leading you into this. The Old Testament is the water. The New Testament is the blood. Together you have the water and the blood. It's, it's so perfect. It just lines up so amazingly. And you can't tell me that this book, oh, it's just a man that, you know, a bunch of men got together, wrote this book, and got that all worked out. I don't think so. I don't think so. Next, we are going to be doing a study in the next of this series. We'll be doing a study on the flesh and the blood of the King Jesus version. And then it gets really interesting. Um, we go into a whole other thing there. Um, so we will be doing that study next. And uh, I pray that you tune into that one. And uh, this whole study series is to strengthen your beliefs in the Word of God. Um, as I said in the last you know, study, um, it's not about belief in me. Um, please don't do that. Um, I want you to have faith in what you're reading. Um, so that is going to be it. Uh, thank you so much for your prayers and your support. Um, this is a lot of work that I'm putting into this, so please do. Well, by the time you're watching this, it will already be done. So, um, But please do pray for me for the Lord's leading in the future. We will see you in the next video. Thank you for watching.